Welcome to the Skeptic Zone, the podcast from Australia for science and reason. Yes, it's the Skeptic Zone podcast, episode number 492. For the 25th of March 2018, Richard Saunders here with you from a um, a blue sky. I think there could be some rain later on. Sydney, Australia. The seasons are turning the... I think we've seen the last of the stinking hot weather. I hope so. And slowly but surely, autumn is here. Although, March and April can be a bit funny... I know you don't tune into the Skeptic Zone to hear Sydney weather reports, but there you go. Coming up on this week's show, we're going to start with the update, the recent update to the Brit Hermes Defence Fund story. You will recall that Brit Hermes was a former naturopath, she's now living in Germany, who writes very strongly against uh, the practices of naturopaths, and she's been threatened with legal action. Well, the Australian sceptics and others rallied to her defence to create a legal defence fund. So I shall be telling you in a little while what the latest status of that defence fund is, and it's all looking very good. Sceptical action on display. Following that, it's a uh, reply, in a sense, to the story we brought you last week, the interview with Kirill Alfarov. Uh, from Berlin, who wrote a piece about the problems with the sceptical movement or why the sceptical movement has not been as successful as uh, we've been led to believe, maybe, in his opinion. Listening. Listening to the podcast was uh, Rob Palmer and uh, Susan Gerbeck from Guerrilla Skepticism on Wikipedia, and they contacted me and I contacted them, and you'll hear their reply uh, to some of the points raised in that story last week. And it's nice to have a bit of a back and forth on any topic. After that, we're going to bring you a report from the Times newspaper from the UK about uh, a homeopathic hospital. And a few weeks ago on The Skeptic Zone, we interviewed Michael Marshall from the Good Thinking Society about the decline, the long and winding road, long and slow decline of homeopathy in the United Kingdom. And this Times story does uh, revolve around the homeopathic hospitals mentioned by Michael Marshall uh, some weeks ago. Then to round off the show, I'm going to play a clip uh, from a panel which I was very uh, honoured to chair in Las Vegas at SciCon last year. The panel was all about uh, the problems of science or the roadblocks to good science. And the panel members were Dr. Rachie Dunlop, Dr. Rachel our reporter and a noted scientist in her own right, of course, Cara Santa Maria, you'd know from The Skeptic's Guide to the Universe, and the aforementioned Brit Hermes. And what a wonderful panel that was. I was just uh, sitting back, sort of steering the conversation, but really it was those three scientists who uh, had the lion's share and they were far more knowledgeable than me. Anyway, I'll play you the last part of that uh, panel. And I'll put a link in the show notes to the full panel, which goes for an hour and 20 minutes, something like that. Uh, a video that uh, the Centre for Inquiry have recently uh, put online. Oh, and you'll hear some laughter not long after the clip starts. That's when George Harab walked on stage with a bucket of uh, ice and water. It was a bit of a running gag. Now, for those people who wrote in to me, uh, desperate to know what the s- winning score was when we did Skeptics in the Pub, the trivia. Now, I've been playing the trivia over the last uh, month here on the Skeptic Zone. We had 60 questions. Uh, I think some questions were worth more than uh, one question each. But nevertheless, at the pub, when we were playing in the pub, the winning team was called the Lepers, and they had a winning score of 54. Very high score, a winning score of 54. So those people who were wondering what other people got out of the 60-odd questions, 54 was the winning score. And I would like to also tell you, uh, and this is something that I've been involved with for many years, way back in 2001, one of the first things I did when I joined the Australian Skeptics was to uh, digitise all the back issues of the magazine The Skeptic from the Australian Skeptics 
And that took the best part of a year because I recreated all the back issues in the page layout program to make nice, clean PDFs because the original copies weren't uh, so good and for other reasons, but that doesn't matter. However, the first uh, 10 years or so, it was decided only to use highlights from the magazines, each of those magazines, in a section uh, under a section of water divining or astrology. And that was fine, but it was decided recently, or last year, to fully digitize all back issues of the Skeptic magazine. And I've been working on that now for quite some time, bit by bit, because a lot of issues were very in very poor condition because there were photocopies of photocopies and sometimes the text had sort of disappeared and it was a matter of recreating articles and things like that. An interesting process, but now all the back issues of the Skeptic magazines in their entirety up till uh, I think last year sometime are available online. www.skeptics.com.au, click the magazine link, all the back issues. And what I've done, and you might consider doing something like this if you for example i have an ipad if you uh, go to that site on your ipad surf there with safari and uh, click on one of the pdfs and it loads into your safari if you then click the little uh, export button at the top of the page you can open that pdf in your ibooks right on your ipad and by doing that you can save the entire back catalog of the skeptic magazine to your device and I've tried this out, and it works fine. It takes a, a little time to do all that. But now I carry around with me the entire history of the Australian skeptics is reported in the Skeptic magazine. A great reference. Great reading. I'm doing a plane trip soon. That'll be interesting reading for me. And it's an invaluable resource for uh, any anyone involved in skeptical uh, studying history of the skeptics, what we thought of this topic or that topic over many, many years. Anyway, certainly worth checking out. Stay tuned. At the end of the show, we're going to have another dice challenge. Every few months on the Skeptic Zone, I roll a number of dice. Die, dice. Here they are now. I have a, a standard six-sided one, which you're very familiar with, a ten-sided one, which is a lot of fun. Good for psychic tests. Ten-sided dice, actually. Good for mathematics. Uh, I have a 30-sided dice and a 60-sided. So we'll give that a go at the end of the show and you can use your psychic predicting powers. <clears throat> but now it's time for me to run downstairs before running quickly back upstairs to continue the show. <clears throat> I'm going to run downstairs. I won't disturb the cats. They're behind me at the moment. One sleeping on the other chair and one sleeping on top of the um, the drawers I have here. I think they're enjoying the morning. I'm going to run a sneak, tiptoe. I'm going to tiptoe downstairs, have some toast with smoked salmon, avocado, and quince jelly. <whistles> While I do that, I hope you enjoy The Skeptic Zone. we bring you an update from the Australian Skeptics website at skeptics.com.au. Brit Hermes Campaign Reaches Significant Milestone by Tim Mendham, published on the 16th of March 2018. Update. The global campaign to support sceptical campaigner Brit Hermes has reached an astonishing milestone with over $100,000 Australian, or 62,000 euro, raised thanks to the generosity of the worldwide sceptical community. The fundraising campaign, organised by Australian Skeptics Inc., ASI, was launched on the 14th of January. The original campaign goal of at least $80,000 Australian, or 50,000 euro, was the amount Brit's lawyer had advised would likely be required, and that figure was reached in less than nine days via more than 2,000 donations. Considering the unpredictable nature of legal costs, the final amount required may vary. While the prime focus of the campaign is to ensure that Brit will not be out of pocket from what might be considerable legal costs, 
The broader message goes beyond her situation. As Hermes herself said in a recent message to donors, quote, the international skeptic and science community stands united to protect the freedom to criticize pseudoscience and preserve the scientific enterprise, end quote. This recent campaign is indicative of a trend over the last decade for cross-border skeptical action. Fired by social media, disparate groups have been able to coordinate programs that raise the profile of skeptics globally and emphasize the power of joint action. Should more funds be raised than required to cover Brit's costs, they will be held for a period of up to 12 months to ensure the legal risk to Brit has passed, after which they will be put into a generalized global skeptics legal defense fund. We will continue to update readers and donors on the progress of the campaign. And that update comes to us from the Australian Skeptics website, skeptics.com.au, with a link in this week's show notes. Hallo aan alle Nederlandse luisteraars. Op dit moment bent u aan het luisteren naar de Skeptic Zone voor wetenschap en kritisch nadenken. Voor meer informatie ga naar www.skepticzone.tv. Now, last week on The Skeptic Zone, I'm sure you will recall we interviewed Kirill Alvarov, all the way from Germany, who wrote a piece, an opinion piece, an essay about the problems with the skeptical movement and um, why, in his opinion, it hasn't been uh, very successful, really, over the last uh, decade or two. And uh, that also is uh, in regard to outreach. Well, listening, listening to The Skeptic Zone, as they do every week, I'm sure, we had uh, Rob Palmer and uh, Susan Gerbeck from Guerrilla Skepticism on Wikipedia. And they both sent me uh, a note, a message. Rob sent me a text message while Susan recorded something, and I'll play that in a second. But Rob says, Hi, Richard. I just heard your interview with Kirill Alvarov on the Skeptic Zone about the skeptical movement failing to do outreach to the public in order to change their hearts and minds. I think I need to comment on what I heard. You may well know what I'm about to say because you interviewed me at PsyCon on this very subject. But here goes. I was thinking as I heard the interview on my car radio, mention Gorilla Skeptics. Mention Gorilla Skeptics. Come on already. Mention Gorilla Skeptics. The interview ended and GSOW was not mentioned at all. If I was part of that conversation, I would have had to interject... That for me, joining and growing GSOW is the best way I've found to reach outside the sceptical bubble and educate those who aren't part of our community. Before joining this team, I was totally frustrated. I wasn't able to change the minds of any true believers I know about virtually anything, and I didn't think there was anything I could do differently. Then, thanks to your podcast, I heard about GSOW. In the year and a half since joining the GSOW team, the 13 articles I created, or largely rewrote on Wikipedia, to add science and fight pseudoscience, collectively have had over 700,000 page viewings and counting. That doesn't even consider the unmeasured number of views on the many, many other articles I have made minor but significant, skeptically orientated changes to. How amazing is that? I often try to visualize that number. It's ten or more baseball stadiums filled with people, and that from just one person, who a little while ago thought there was nothing they could do to help the movement. One example of what GSOW can do, ironically, was brought up by Kirill. He asserted that no one outside the skeptical movement knows about Randy's involvement with Yuri Geller on The Tonight Show not true. A long time ago, I added a section to Geller's wiki article documenting the entire thing. The result is about 10,000 people per month since then have accessed that article, 
and were able to read all about it. Many may be true believers and be reading about this for the first time. It may make at least some percentage reconsider that Geller is genuine, and by extension, maybe start to doubt all other woo peddlers. As a whole, GSOW team has over 24 million page views on just our major articles, with a million more added every month. Millions. I find that mind-boggling. But with all the woo in the world, it's never enough. The larger the team gets, the more we can do. So the best way I know to interject the sceptical viewpoint into the information available to the general public is to grow the size of the Guerrilla Skeptics team. Anyway, love the zone, but just had to point this out. Keep up the good work. Thanks, Rob. Thanks for your point of view. And it, uh, it's nice to have a bit of uh, back and forth on this topic. And here is the message sent to me by Susan Gerbeck. Hello, everyone. This is Susan Gerbeck from the GSOW Wikipedia Project. Richard asked for my thoughts on the interview he did with Carell just last week. After Rob Palmer, who is one of my GSOW editors, reached out to Richard, uh, Krill and I are good friends, and he shared the essay with me months ago, and I told him that I agreed with parts of it and not other parts. I also know something that most other ed- uh, most other people don't know, the listeners who didn't read the essay, and that is that Krill did single out the GSOW project in his essay. He wrote... A number of skeptical initiatives are an exception to the rule and are outward-looking. A illustrious example of this is Susan Gerbeck's Gorilla Skepticism on Wikipedia Project. It's a perfect example of activism that is focused on non-skeptic audiences. Thanks to Wikipedia's reporting tools, the reach of GSOW is also quantifiable. And so this part didn't make it into the interview with Richard. And Rob is very passionate about GSOW, as are the rest of the team. In fact, Rob learned of GSOW from the Skeptic Zone, and he lives on the east coast of the United States. We do get a lot of our GSOW people from the Skeptic Zone, and I have a large group that are Australian. So GSOW has just published our 563rd Wikipedia page. Those 563 pages have just hit 24 million 147,850 page views. Most are in English, but a good chunk of these Wikipedia pages are in other languages. We add about 34,000 page views a day, and we're getting really close to hitting 100,000 page views a month. And we're always looking for more people to train into GSOW, so do please contact me on Facebook if you're interested. So back to Krill. I've traveled all over the world these last few years speaking to skeptic groups, and I've been thinking a lot about these questions. I disagree with Krill about podcasts. I think we're still at the beginning of podcasts' influence. They're allowing us to reach audiences all over that miss the face-to-face gatherings, and we need more podcasts, especially in languages other than English. Conferences are also incredibly important to grow our community. The first steps towards activism is when you meet people face-to-face and find out you're not alone. And I hear all the time from new GSOW people and also whenever I travel how important podcasting is to those people. Now here is where I do agree with Krill. Other problems, our problems are time, resources, and money. We already have experts and we have motivated people and those people are usually just waiting to be told how to help. And we need more managerial type people. I think people are under the illusion that in order to lead, you need to be an academic or part of a large organization. And that's just not true. What I propose are small focus groups with an end goal on a fixed time scale. Made up of people who are not necessarily in proximity to each other, but share the same goal. And you can use secret Facebook groups. It's really easy to do. It's cheap and Uh, very effective and I do it all the time with various psychic psychic stings that I run so I'm going to give you one example real quick of one of our latest projects that we're running right now it's called Operation Hunt and Peck and it's about facilitated communication 
FC is what it's called for short. And it's the low-hanging fruit. I mean, we already know it's discredited and we know how it's, well, doesn't work, but we already know all that. There's lots of academic work that's already been done on it. So it needs to go. We need a success under our, under our belt, and I think facilitated communication is where we should be starting. So I've gathered up experts and people who care a lot about this project. They're already on, on page with us. And so that was step one. Step two is to put all the Wikipedia pages in order that have anything to do with facilitated communication. Because when we start making a fuss, the public is going to want to know what facilitated communication is and why should they care. A book isn't going to work. Nobody's going to read a book about it. A website or blog, no. The way you're really going to get the attention of the public is to make sure that they have a place to go to that is free and easy and It's Wikipedia, right? So that's already done. Those Wikipedia pages are completely done in um, pro and con, and all the resources are there. They're in great shape. GSOW has taken care of that. So the third step, we're picking a target. So facilitated communication holds workshops on university campuses in the United States, and they use the university's name to give them credibility. So what I think we should do is we should try to get the universities to cancel those workshops. So now I think this tactic is cheaper and quicker than getting the laws passed. And we might be able, we might need help from you all to help us out to convince these institutions to stop supporting facilitated communication. So please be on the lookout for a call for help. And this is just our first attempt. So let's see if this works. This tactic can be used for other causes Let's live and learn and see how it goes. And thanks, Rob and Richard, for encouraging me to record this. And Krill, I appreciate your thoughts. So reach out to me on Facebook if you're interested in anything I have mentioned or have further questions. And thank you, Skeptic Zone listeners. We do love you. Now, I still consider the article from Kirill Alvarov to be very important and worth your time to read, but it is good to get uh, some feedback from time to time. Thank you, Rob, and thank you, Susan. Skeptic Zone listeners, do you live in or near Glasgow or are you planning to visit sometime? Then you're in luck because Glasgow Skeptics have got your Monday nights sorted. We're committed to filling up every available Monday night with talks on science and scepticism. Past speakers include Eugenie Scott, Jerry Coyne, Michael Marshall, Nate Phelps, Tom and Cecil from Cognitive Dissonance, PZ Myers, Richard Wiseman, AC Grayling, Noah Heath and Eli from The Scathing Atheist, Simon Singh, Rebecca Watson, and a multitude of local academics and sceptics. There's literally nothing better you can do on a Monday night in Glasgow that doesn't involve taking your clothes off. So come join us. We've also got a vibrant online community. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and get involved with the discussion. Glasgow Sceptics. Self-help for your brain. Here's a report that uh, was published in the Times newspaper on Monday, the 19th of March, 2018. This has been brought to my attention by Michael Marshall at the Good Thinking Society. Banned for hospital where the Queen's homeopath works by Chris Mythe, health editor. The hospital where the Queen's homeopath works has been banned from offering homeopathy to the National Health Service patients for disobeying health service policy. An audit found that the Royal London Hospital for Integrated Medicine has been wrongly charging the alternative treatment to taxpayers. The hospital is Europe's biggest 
publicly funded centre for alternative medicine and has been offering homeopathy since it was founded in 1849. The ruling will put further pressure on NHS units offering the treatment. Last year, Simon Stevens, chief executive of NHS England, called homeopathy, quote, a misuse of scarce NHS funds, end quote. Homeopathy uses extremely diluted remedies for which there is little evidence to support their effectiveness. Some sceptics acknowledge, however, that the conversations that alternative practitioners have with their patients often have a placebo effect. NHS bosses say that cutting funding for the treatment will save £50,000 a year. However, Peter Fisher, research director of the hospital and homeopath to the Queen, insists that the decision will cost the NHS more as doctors have to use more expensive medicines instead. Quote, We see a huge number of patients on outrageous numbers of drugs, end quote, he said. Quote, we are still not giving advice on diet, lifestyle and physiological things. That is what matters to people rather than the 15th drug, end quote. NHS bosses have previously told the hospital not to use homeopathy, but an audit carried out under pressure from campaigners found widespread breaches of the policy. The hospital was using homeopathy but not declaring it because it was part of a wider treatment which the hospital thought was permitted. A handful of patients were treated only with homeopathy. Michael Marshall of the Good Thinking Society said, quote, The decision to end funding for homeopathy on the NHS in London is long overdue. Despite what is claimed by fringe groups and outlier studies, the evidence on the ineffectiveness of homeopathy has been clear for a long time. End quote. A spokesman for Camden Clinical Commissioning's group, which sets NHS funding policy for the hospital, said it was, quote, committed to making the best use of public money and our policy is not to fund homeopathy treatment, end quote. A spokesman for the hospital said that there had been a, quote, difference of interpretation of the policy, end quote, and it had agreed not to provide homeopathy on the NHS. Again, that story comes to us from the Times newspaper, published on Monday the 19th of March 2018 by Chris Smythe, health editor. And thanks to Michael Marshall for bringing this to our attention. Last year it was my privilege to chair a panel about Roadblocks to Good Science. It was a wide-ranging panel, uh, touching on many issues, but I thought I'd play you the last 20 minutes of the panel, uh, where Dr. Rachel Dunlop, Cara Santa Maria, and Brit Hermes discuss some of the problems in science and possible solutions. The ratio of it actually might be higher because there's less people in the community. Oh, interesting. Thank you very, thank you very much for your insult, uh, insults. Insights. <laughs> paging Dr. Freud. Paging Dr. Freud. Right? I'll just go back to my old white man club now. So <laughs> Oh, somebody write that down. Okay. Well, um, we've still got a little bit of time, so I'd like to cover some other uh, issues right now when we might come to think about problems in science. And one of the biggest problems, Dr. Rachie, uh, in the last few years for us, certainly has been fraud. Yeah. And let's point the finger at Andrew Wakefield because his <laughs> fraud, wherever he is, down there somewhere... <laughs> He's moving to LA, apparently. Oh, no. Yeah. Why? I just heard last night, and um, apparently, I think he's possibly going to be starting a TV show on vaccine injury, and so he's going to be based in LA. Do gross. you know if that's, like, got public... Or is it, it a TV show on actual network? Or we, don't, we, we don't know, and I can't take the... <laughs> <laughs> Ha, 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 ha.
<laughs> the other guy is out there. That's <laughs> 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 hilarious. <laughs> It's nice to know George has a career after entertainment, isn't it? Um, <laughs> and speaking, yeah. speaking of fraud... Um... So, no, I can't take the credit for this either. A friend of mine has been diligently watching all the live videos out of the Vax tour in America, mm. and she gleaned that piece of information last night where he just Horrifying. mentioned that he's moving. But to go back to, to fraud, I mean, the... the The problem of publish or perish never goes away in science. And if you don't know what that means, basically, peer-reviewed publications are currency in science. They um, make your CV long. They are the reason you'll get grants. They are the reason you'll get promotions. So you need to publish scientific peer-reviewed papers. And that is hard, particularly in the wet sciences, like the... Well, all of them, really, but I'm speaking from my own personal experience... Biology never goes the way you hope it goes. It never does what you ask it to do. <laughs> and, you know, I mentioned earlier that I got completely different results in some of my recent experiments than what I expected. Um, but you have to somehow package that up into a nice, shiny little paper so you can present it to your board, to your directors, to your funding bodies. And so there's enormous pressure on researchers to publish and to publish often. And this, unfortunately, leads to people cutting corners because they are so pressured to do so. Um, Many of us in this room would be aware of Chris Shaw, Professor Chris Shaw, who is a... He's in the Department of Ophthalmology at um, the university, a university in Canada, and he publishes anti-vaccine papers all the time. Um, and just recently... Oh, it's just like... It's so dumb and it annoys me so much. There's a technique called Western blotting where you end up with these little bands that look like just a line on a paper. And... You know, ultimately when you do develop... It's like a a photography development process for you to get that little band. And ultimately when you do that, you're going to get artefacts introduced, like a hair or a dot or something. But scientists repeatedly do this. They copy and paste those bands into different experimental lanes. And maybe they flip them upside down or maybe they flip them the other way. But they never remove the artefacts. And so it's so obvious that they've done it. I've seen this. Yeah. And it drives me mental because it's like, get Photoshop out and put it up. Like, if you're going to cheat, cheat properly. <laughs> and recently, Christopher Shaw had a paper retracted for, for precisely that reason. The bands in this case were actually polymerase chain reaction bands. And you could easily see that there was these two bands. One was supposed to be the untreated animals, one was supposed to be the treated animals. But the bands, if you flip them and turn them, they were the same. And so the paper got pulled, and his, his, it actually went all over the world, the reports of this, because it was a controversial study to begin with. He was trying to claim that aluminium causes autism. And he said in response, well, to be fair... Nobody zooms in on these things and looks like, you know, looks at the artifacts in them. And I'm like, dude, wow. of course we do that. And there are people that work in research who dedicate their lives to looking for things like that. Mm-hmm. And it's not very difficult if you have half a brain. And then he also said, well, in my defence, the data, the raw data has gone to China with my postdoc. And that also breaches the ethics of the university. You're not supposed to take data off the premises because the intellectual property belongs to the university where it was generated. And so it is a dumpster fire, but this is not the first time this particular group has had papers retracted. Um, But to go back to Wakefield as well, and I mentioned this briefly yesterday at SGU, one of the problems with papers that get retracted for fraud is that they get cited more often after they've been retracted. And that is a real problem in science, isn't it? And, you know, I spend a lot of time trawling the depths of the anti-vaccination movement online. Did you say trawling or trolling? Uh, Yeah. (laughs) A bit of both. (laughs) Um, And they don't care that a paper's retracted anyway. That's not relevant to them because they're cherry-picking the data to get for their confirmation bias. So... It, it's not relevant to them that it's retracted. That still is a thing. Anyway. Yeah. But, but this is a problem science tries to address as best it can. Absolutely. I mean, Of course. The yeah. scientists on the journals, you know, the peers who are doing the review, are the ones who are pushing for these retractions. 
Oh, like yeah. within the scientific community, a retracted paper is is a black box. You know yeah. what I mean? It's like, but it's outside of the scientific community where the problem lies. It's with the marketing. It's with the individuals who are using these retracted. And and the the bad thing is, you mentioned not only does sometimes, especially if it's quite a famous pair, uh, paper, does it get cited more often after it's retracted, but also, I mean, study after study show that. The, the retraction gets no traction, right? That, yeah. like, yeah. once you, you can't unring a bell. Yeah. And so, once you go out there and there's a big splash within the media, and people say, This is what we found, this is a real effect. And then later they go, Oh, it turns out that effect's not real. Nobody listens Buried. to the retraction. Yeah. Buried, yes. That, but there are some great organizations like Retraction Watch. I highly yeah. recommend following Retraction Watch. It's not only do they keep their eyes out as a real public service of what is getting retracted, but they do really good public communication of science, really good write arounds around it to explain you know, what's going on with that. The problem is, you know, only nerds like us are reading this. Yeah. Right, yeah. Right. But I, I think I mean, we could do a little bit of a better job preventing fraud in the first place. Yeah. I, I mean, for medical journals, for example, and publishing clinical trials, we could do a better job making sure that the research trials are uh, registered and that the results have been published within the appropriate time frame yeah. before, you know, letting the work get published. When it comes to, uh, like, our field in basic science, I think we could perhaps do a better job in making sure our scripts are included, perhaps, in the data set. So the statistical work could be checked Mm -hmm. because a lot of errors get made here, sometimes intentionally, sometimes not intentionally. But it's it's another way to check it if you have the, the... uh, the script to look through, making sure that the gen bank sequences or the DNA sequences is actually uh, where the researcher says it is, that it's actually been deposited online, that these, these little things are actually followed through on. Because oftentimes, especially as a new researcher, you know, I'm going back paper after paper after paper, and I'm in the methods section, and I'm going through it, and the results aren't where they say they are, or the, the DNA sequence that I'm looking for is not where they said it yeah, is, yeah. or I'm looking at this statistical package and trying to track it down, and I get halfway through, and it doesn't make sense. And these are easy things yeah. to check and or to require. Just steps missing. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Yeah. Like, you can't like oh, yeah, oops, I didn't tell you how I did this PCR. <laughs> yeah. And I then mean, how are yeah. you supposed to, to emulate that? And you know what? Here's, here's a thought. Might be unpopular. Because we've talked about jargon in the past and and about why jargon is important and what jargon actually is in science and the purpose that it serves. But I I read a recent um, neuroskeptic uh, um, blog where (laughs) individuals have gone in and looked at the readability of scientific articles and they're getting worse and worse. And so Mm. maybe make your paper easier to understand. Yeah, this drives me crazy. I completely agree with that. Because you know what? It's really hard to replicate a study if... If it's unnecessarily fancy. If it takes you 10 times to read this paper before you even understand what's going on. I I, I have a bugbear about this thing called self-plagiarization in science. It drives me insane. So I understand that you can't plagiarise. That's fine. But in the methods section of a paper, you're supposed to describe your experiments to enough detail that someone else can reproduce them. And if you do the same methods often, you cannot copy and paste that into into your recent publication. And I had an experience recently where I wanted to find someone's method and I had to go back to like six or seven of their previous publications because they said, as described previously, got there. As described previously, okay. As <laughs> exactly. described. It's like and a I, Russian doll. And I ended up at a book chapter mm-hmm. that was in a library in... I don't know, some, I couldn't access it. Yeah. From like it's 1978. Yeah. I know, it, it's totally It's like nuts. out of print. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, <Jeez>. what the <laughs> hell? Just, but I wanted to just add quickly on the, on the topic of public or perish that predatory publishing now mm-hmm. has become a huge area of grey literature where um, basically companies are popping up all over the place taking advantage of the fact that scientists have this huge pressure to publish and setting up basically fake journals where they'll say, if you pay me 300 bucks, I'll publish your paper and you'll get it within a week and there's going to be no peer review. Except they don't always overtly say that. They don't right? say that. Yeah. No. And so they don't, you know, a young researcher might not even know. No, they don't. And there is a company that has turned this into a huge industry now which um, has translated into conferences where they will look at conferences in a particular area of expertise. They'll change the title of theirs slightly, 
but not enough that you might notice it's not this highly prestigious conference. And then they'll just take bios and photos of scientists who are prestigious in the area, put them on a website and say, Cara is speaking at this conference, mm. but they haven't asked you and they haven't <laughs> told you. And so if you find yourself on this website and you email them and say, please remove me, I'm not involved in this, they won't do that either. Yeah. And then they'll charge $3,000 for you to turn up to a fake conference. And one of the things that I find so frustrating about that is that academics are so shruggy about it. Yeah. Like, I think David Gorski maybe invented the term shruggy, but I found when I was in the university system that I would say, okay, the dean of research here, you need to stand up in front of all the academics and warn them of these specific um, operations and what they do and tell them not to, to publish their, do not go to their conferences. They're like, Bleh. That's how I ended up here, actually. (laughs) I think sometimes we rely too heavily in the sciences on our understanding of the big picture. And so we're like, well, science is self-correcting, right? Mm. And, like, eventually enough people are going to try and replicate that. But the problem is it's only like that if we are active. Exactly. And we do it. And and, And relying on somebody else to do the work is a recipe for disaster, especially because... There's something good about science becoming very spread out. You know, it's no longer monolithic, which is a wonderful thing. But when it becomes so spread out that studies are never replicated, when it becomes so spread out that nobody is ever talking to one another anymore, then what you end up with is no checks and balances and no self-correction within science and just a flood of information and no way to know what is legitimate and what's not because we're just assuming that because these people are professionals, they don't make mistakes. There's a big difference between overt intentional fraud and kind of under-the-radar mistakes that are made, but the outcome often is the same, and we have to remember that. Yeah, absolutely. Richie, is there a a collection that lists, or someplace that we can go that... Um, has a list of the predatory journals because I'm often yeah. looking yeah. to oh. figure it out but yeah. I don't know where to go. Retraction Watch which is what Cara mentioned um, so there used to be a librarian called Jeffrey Beale and he would curate a list of predatory publishers and it just kept getting longer and longer and longer and then one day his list disappeared from the internet and he went dark and it went dark and nobody knows why it, if, unless anyone has an update mm. in the audience. Mm. So it's been mirrored now by Retraction Watch. Okay. So Retraction Watch has a list of predatory publishers that they try to update and it just keeps getting longer and longer. But yeah, a look in Retraction Watch. That's good advice. I, I, I do like learning new things like that along the way at these uh, sessions. Well, folks, as Carl Sagan said, and I remind you once more, the method of science is tried and true. It is not perfect, but it's the best we have. In the couple of minutes we have remaining to us, Spitballing, I guess you'd say, what can we do to improve the, the general method of science or the problems it faces? Rachie. Um, I think that we should work closely with media. And we've had a lot of success doing this in Australia as scientists because media is our... Uh, they are our mouthpiece and they are often accused of badly translating science and writing bad articles. And that's our fault. We need to, to deal with them well. We need to work with them Because if we want people to understand what we do, if we want to attract public funding, we want our work to be communicated well. And so we try to do that in Australia. The other thing that I don't think is really known very well in this country is a website called The Conversation. And this is um, an academic website where if you have a position in in an academic institution, you can write articles for them in consultation with an editor, so they'll help you to, to structure it. It's usually only 800 words, and it's, it's got a Creative Commons license on it. Yeah, it's like so, a wire service. So yeah. Siam will pick it up. It'll Science get News. picked up yeah. by whoever wants to republish it, yeah. and you only have to write one article, and then the, you can see it go viral, potentially. Mm-hmm. So that's such a great way to get your science out to the public. I think that's good. I think that, um, you know... It's, it's hard to solve all these problems individually, and I think that we could put a bunch of Band-Aids in different <laughs> places, and we can say, you know, you need to be more responsible as a scientist, or you, we need to be better about communicating. So all these things are important. But I do think that something that's more kind of central and fundamental is that as an educational approach, I personally believe 
that we need more ethics education and we mm. need, need more philosophy education yeah. within the sciences. Yeah. And if more individual scientists, but also individuals who don't study science at all, just people who go through college, are, are well-versed in basic philosophy and basic ethics, um, that could go a long way. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. I 100% agree with and that. And Britt, you have a, a rather interesting perspective on all this, I know. Yeah. Well, I, I have different ideas sort of floating through my head. You know, on, on, on a global scale, I think we have to get... Um, I would like to see more physicians involved, actually, and, um, and at an earlier level, so at the medical school level. And I'm really fortunate in that I have a bit of a younger audience, so I have a lot of people in med school reaching out to me to... Uh, get advice from me about how to talk to their patients and future patients about alternative medicine. But what I was going to say was that I think we should start having, start practicing difficult conversations with people who are close to us in our lives. Mm -hmm. So uh, I study evolutionary genomics, and I was able to successfully explain my uh, research and the point of my research to family members who are fundamental Christians. Mm -hmm. Wow. And, and, and we had a very lovely conversation and everyone stayed respectful and this is a difficult thing to do, but I think this is a good, it was a safe place for me to start. Maybe it's not always safe for people to start talking about this stuff within their family, but it was a good place to start uh, to try to figure out how to have these conversations with people who are very different than me and have a very different background and a very different ideology than me. And I think the better that we can get at having these difficult conversations from people from all walks of life, the, the better that we are going to be as a group, the more successful we're going to be as a group, um, we'll continue to grow. And, um, and I think the future and the outlook is going to be much more successful for us and much um, much better for us in the end if we can learn to have these respectful conversations. I think you're right. Yeah. And the fact that we acknowledge that there are so many problems in science can only be a good thing that we can address the problems once we identify them. Ladies and gentlemen, what a, an honor it's been to share the stage with such august company. Would you thank Dr. Rachel Dunlop, Cara Santa Maria, and Bill Hermes? Thank you to Dr. Rachel Dunlop, Cara Santa Maria, and Brit Hermes for your insights into some of the problems in science. And again, you can see the full panel discussion uh, links in the show notes. for listening to The Skeptic Zone. And, oh yes, what's this? Opens the window, another plane flying over. Those people who uh, regularly listen to The Skeptic Zone know that uh, if I record my introduction pieces and uh, the uh, end piece on a Sunday morning, it's the flight path time in Sydney. Not that the cats care. Now, I promised you the dice game. All right, here we go. We'll start with six. Going to roll the six-sided dice now. If I keep using the word dice where I should say die, just uh, just put up with it. Here we go. Six. So use your psychic predicting power. I'm rolling a six. And it's come up with six. There we go. And I'll move up to the ten-sided. Here we go. Ready? Predict away 10-sided. What do you predict it's going to be? Four. That's the next number along. I move up now to the 30-sided dice. Here we go. 30-sided. Will it be a low number or a high number? Crunch, crunch, crunch. Nine. Finally, and it's quite an amazing thing, this, 60-sided dice. Here we go. Rolls to a slow stop on six. That's interesting. So, well, I had to come up on something. So the numbers are six, four, nine, and six. How did you do?
And if you got all four numbers right, you beat odds of about uh, 108,000 to one. Well done. Coming up on next week's show, probably some UFOs, I think. I'm going to be meeting with my good friend, Dr. Steve Roberts, one of the uh, skeptics, um, UFO experts. How, and he always says, how can you be an expert in something that doesn't exist or probably doesn't exist? Well, of course, when we say UFO, the general population understand that to mean uh, alien spaceship, not really unidentified flying object. The popular... Uh, in the popular imagination, I'm sure if you said to anybody, have you seen a UFO, alien spaceship is the thing they think about. Anyway, I'm going to be visiting Dr. Steve Roberts, and uh, I'm sure that topic will come up. In fact, I'm spending some time in Melbourne, Victoria, to go to the State Library of Victoria to continue my research into the Great Prediction Project. Now, this is going into its second year where I'm collating every published psychic prediction I can find made in Australia uh, since the year 2000. It's quite an undertaking. And there are hundreds and hundreds of predictions to uh, find and then put into spreadsheets. And then the laborious part is really uh, checking them. Some are too vague. Some contradict each other. Most are wrong. Some are right, which you would expect anyway, given enough predictions. But it's a fascinating project. And I think I have alluded to this before. I might need help. And if I do, it might be your opportunity to help along the way. We'll see. We'll see. And before I go, a reminder that I do appreciate the sponsors of The Skeptic Zone, and I don't take paid advertising. What I mean by that is people like you listening to the show who contribute sometimes a dollar a week, two dollars a week, five dollars, twenty dollars a week via Patreon or PayPal at skepticzone.tv. And as I like to remind you, it's because of people like you that everybody gets to enjoy, well, I hope enjoy, The Skeptic Zone. But until next week, this is Richard Saunders signing off from Sydney, Australia. You've been listening to The Skeptic Zone podcast. Please visit our website at www.skepticzone.tv for show notes, contacts, and to access the back catalogue of episodes going back to 2008. You can follow the Skeptic Zone podcast on Twitter at Skeptic Zone, visit our Facebook page, or leave a review on iTunes. You can also support the Skeptic Zone via Patreon or PayPal. The Skeptic Zone podcast is an independent production. The views and opinions expressed on the Skeptic Zone are not necessarily those of Australian skeptics or any other skeptical organization.